Now, this week we will be studying prayer. <clears throat> prayer, there are several aspects to prayer, obviously, but um, one of the main things that stands out to me is whenever I first started really studying in depth, I got a hold of um, some books that were actually called uh, A Great Cloud of Witnesses, something like that. It was like two different volumes. And what it was is a man went around to all of the great men of God at that time, there was about 10 of them he went to, and asked them certain questions and got the same you know, answers concerning those questions. And put them in these books for people to read about these men's personal lives, how they got saved, how they got filled with the Spirit, uh, you know, just very, how does God talk to you, just different things like that that they would ask. And one of them was, what is your prayer life like? And it was funny because several of them spoke different things and they would say different things. But one of them, uh, matter of fact, Teal Osborne was, you know, he is amazingly gracious in dealing with people and how he handles people. But it was funny because when they, when they asked him, what is your prayer life like? His answer was very short. He said, that's personal, it's private, and it's none of your business. And, you know, which is really, you know, not like him. You know, usually he's very gracious, like I said, and very open about things. But... He said, you, actually he, later on he gave uh, clarification and he said, you, you might as well ask me what my intimate relations with my wife is like. He said, that's how dear and how close that is to me. He said, there, there is no way I could tell you what it's like. And so he was a little more forthcoming with it. But um, prayer is one of those topics that's probably the most talked about and least done. You know, more people talk about it than they actually do it. And so that's one of the reasons why in JGLM we have tried to tell people before. Uh, many times people use prayer as, an, exa- as a, uh, an excuse. They will say it. For instance, if you're somewhere and someone says, oh yeah, this is my problem. Christians typically have the response of, well, we'll, we'll pray for you. Right? Meaning we're going to do it later at church or sometime and then they never do it. And so that's one of the reasons why we emphasize in JGLM when someone says it. Right then, we pray for them right then. We don't wait. We don't say, well, well, we'll bring it up tonight at prayer service or whatever else it is. So, in, the, um, in prayer, it is amazingly simple because it is, you know, it, like we have in the very number one there, what is prayer? It's real simple. It is communication with God, right? And so... And there's a couple of things I want to emphasize too because prayer has all kinds of aspects and we will be talking about a lot of these this week. There are, for instance, uh, confessing the Word of God, confessing Scripture like we do every morning and, and bringing these things out. That is a form of prayer, but it's not prayer in its purest form, so to speak. However, the Bible does say, Jesus, or uh, actually in the Old Testament, it says to remind God of His promises, to remind Him of His of his statements and, and the things that he has promised. And so we do remind God. At one point it even says, plead your case. That you are to plead your case before God. So, but remember that all that was from under the Old Covenant and from an Old Testament mindset. So it's a little bit different today. Now, there are aspects. Uh, most prayer, and if you look at Jesus' prayer, it, it tells how many times he prayed. We're going to look at various ways that he prayed and what the Bible says about prayer. But it it really never tells you how he prayed. And it doesn't give you any real examples of his prayer. Anytime, number one, when it comes to healing or any kind of power display, he never prayed. He only commanded. Right? So even when he stood at Lazarus' grave, he prayed very shortly to God. And then he said, the only reason I'm praying is to let the people know that I'm with you and who I represent. And he said, I, you know, I pray and I know that you hear me. I know that you always hear me. And so... Uh, he didn't even pray there. So we don't really have a lot of uh, examples of Jesus praying. Uh, there was one time whenever they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he taught them. He said, when you pray, say this. And so he gave them a, a form prayer, which was a common thing for a rabbi to do at the time, was to have a, a set formal prayer that, that kind of gave, epitomized what their message was about, so to speak. And so he did do that. It tells us over and over again, he went alone to pray. He went into a mountain to pray. He went into the garden to pray. There was many times, but it doesn't give you the specifics, really, of what he said or did while he was there. And the closest we come to that is in the garden uh, just before his crucifixion. Now, 
as we look at this, prayer is, number one, communication with God. So prayer can be spoken. It can be even quiet. But you have to remember that for certain things, it needs to be spoken. In other words, if you're, if you're trying to accomplish certain things, if there, are things you, if there are problems that you're trying to get solved, then there are times when you need to speak the answer out. Now, the difference in how we teach prayer and how we practice prayer is, is very fundamental to the JGLM message. I mean, if you get down to it, that's probably the major difference uh, of who we are. Now, uh, last week we had a question we didn't really get to, and, but it was basically saying, you know, if when we're born again, if we get everything, then we don't have to do anything anymore. You know, there's no more seeking God, no more going after these things and, and asking God this or asking God that. Yes and no. Okay, first off, when you get born again, the Spirit of God dwelling in you, Christ is birthed in you, with Christ and in Christ is hid all the wisdom and knowledge in the universe, basically. Everything is in Him. And if everything is in Him and He is in you, then technically it's there. All right? So it's not a matter of seeking it to get it. Now, we have to be very specific because the Bible is clear when it talks about seeking God. And let me just kind of cut to the back of the book. In Hebrews, it says that God, that anybody that comes to God must know that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And so that would lead us to believe that we are to diligently seek God. Well, there, there's truth to that. that we, but the difference is what, we are, what we're seeking and how. Now, if, and in a lot of it's terminology, but it's how it's applied that's important. Because I'm going to make very blanket statements. First off, when you get born again, now remember, born again, you receive everything you need for your own personal life. The baptism in the Spirit is not for your own personal life. It is an endowment of service for the kingdom and to others. Now, so when you get born again, you have everything you need for yourself. Then, when you receive the baptism of the Spirit, you receive everything you need to be able to minister to others the way Jesus did with power. And in many cases, now understand this clearly, yes, He is the vine, we are the branches. We are not separated from Him. However, we do have the ability to act, and when I say independently, I don't mean separate from him, I mean of our own accord, meaning we get to choose to step out, to command, and what we say will come to pass, what we believe will happen, what we have faith for will come to pass. And so, while you are connected, it's just, that, you know, the best, again, the best illustration that I have for it is a soldier on the field somewhere. <clears throat> they represent their government, they have the ability to act, and in many cases, they have, per, well, they have parameters within which they are told to act. But when it comes down to an individual situation, they have to choose what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. So when it comes down to it, they are independent in the sense that they command or control themselves based on the parameters that they are given in training. Does that make sense to you? Can,